Welcome back, everyone, as we continue talking about the Wars of Scottish Independence, specifically the first War of Scottish Independence. We're going to get into the story of William Wallace now, the real story of William Wallace. Uh, the movie Braveheart does portray a fictionalized kind of version of the Battle of Stirling Bridge. We're going to see what really happened there. If you did not see the first part of this series, there's a link in the description below. There will also be a link to the original content. Really encourage you to check out History March. They have a lot of fantastic stuff on battles that cover a great bit of history going all the way back to ancient times. And we're going to be doing more in the future. So let's go ahead and dive into the Battle of Stirling Bridge with William Wallace. Twelve ninety six had proved a calamitous year for the battered kingdom of Scotland. Four years before, King Edward I of England had judged John Balliol as the rightful king of Scots, but in doing so, never missed an opportunity to undermine and humiliate John in the years leading to twelve ninety six. By twelve ninety five, the Scottish lords took matters into their own hands, forming a council to effectively rule on Balliol's behalf and forging an alliance with England's enemy, the King of France. So why form a council to rule on the king's behalf and therefore kind of dilute the king's authority even further? Well, because if you know your king is in the pocket of the English king, you're going to take some of that authority away from him or at least make it harder for him to just do the bidding of the English king. You're going to go around him. Uh, so that's what's happening here. Balliol at this point is effectively done as being any kind of an effective leader for Scotland. So they're going to look to other people, people like William Wallace. Having extracted very public oaths of fealty from the Scottish king, as well as all the leading lords during the Great Cause period, Edward felt entirely justified in coming down on the Scots with brutal ease. In 1296, the Scots had been decisively bested in the Siege of Berwick and the Battle of Dunbar. Dunbar in particular had exposed Scottish inadequacies in the art of war, their charge against the English under John de Warren quickly devolving into a confused rout. It's a battle they could have won and they just it was bad tactics. That's just showing you how they've got some stuff to learn. And we're going to see William Wallace and then later on Robert the Bruce. They're going to be much more effective in the battlefield. They're going to learn their enemy. They're going to learn what the weaknesses are of the English and how they fight and what the, the strengths would be for the Scottish. The lines were broken by the terrain and the ordered English countercharge. Well, it's time for a remake of an epic classic. The Oregon Trail is nice. back. Experience the trials and tribulations of the road to Oregon. This, if you are of my generation, I'm 45, so I'm kind of the tail end of Gen X. Uh, this was like a classic game uh, for me growing up. My first computer was a uh, Commodore 64. And so there are like these games that I will always remember. Games like Impossible Mission and Red Storm Rising uh, and... The original Oregon Trail was another one. And, the, you know, the, you have died of dysentery became like this classic line. And this is a really good remake. It's updated, so it's new, it's cool. I, I don't know why I'm commenting on the ad, but, you know. You start off by assembling your party and gearing up your wagon with weapons, food, medicine, spare parts, and other provisions. And you'll need to carefully ration them as the journey to Oregon will be long. I played the game for a few hours and I faced tough choices, dangers and unexpected situations. Each party member has their own strengths and weaknesses, so it was a challenge to have all of them survive blizzards, broken limbs, snake bites, exhaustion, starvation and the dreaded dysentery. I had to make sure I have the needed tools to repair any damage to my wagon and that my pack animals are healthy, rested and fed to avoid getting stranded and doomed. Along the trail there are outposts and towns where I bartered for supplies. Following Dunbar and King Edward's subjugation of the realm, Edward had appointed the aging Earl of Surrey as his lieutenant in Scotland. Yet though a staunch supporter of his, King Surrey despised his new position. According to one source, the Earl ran afoul of the Scottish weather 
to the extent that he was actually based in the north of England. He's like, forget this. Unfortunately for the Scots, the absence of their governor did not translate into light rule. Perhaps the most hated man in the kingdom was Hugh de Cressingham, Edward's treasurer, who was based in Berwick. Unlike Surrey, Cressingham was zealous in his role of satiating Edward's perpetual need of money. Ordinary folk smarted at the confiscation of wool to be sold in Flanders. And if, if you heard my recommendation yesterday uh, in the previous video about uh, watching Outlaw King, which is a fantastic movie and much closer to the reality, though it's still got some things that are wrong, but um, you'll see a scene where the Scottish lords are collecting these funds that are going to be sent to Edward to pay the debts for their previous uh, rebellion. To help fund their conqueror's war against the French. This anger was inflamed further by rumors that soon Edward would demand military service in his foreign war. Yep. For Edward, hammering the nobility into submission the previous year equated to subduing all folk as a matter of course. However, Edward had made a dangerous enemy in the Scottish church, who opposed his appointment of English priests in their sphere. Such a network of educated men was the ideal conduit for communicating ideas of resistance against the hated occupiers. So I mentioned yesterday, uh, kind of looking ahead to an incident that I'm sure we're going to cover at some point between Robert the Bruce and John Cummin, who is going to become kind of his big rival for the throne, um, that's going to require the Bruce to have the backing of the church. And you can see there Robert Wisher, he's going to be the key member of the clergy in getting uh, the support for Robert the Bruce to be king, but also getting Robert the Bruce's support for the church. Uh, and uh, if you ever get the chance, if you go to Glasgow, visit the Glasgow Cathedral. It's such an amazing uh, place to be. Uh, a lot of the scenes for Outlaw King were actually filmed there. And it's just in front of the Glasgow Necropolis, which if you're into really cool cemeteries, that's a really cool cemetery. Um, I filmed a bunch of... Uh, content there. I just haven't put it up yet. But um, if you've seen the movie The Batman uh, with Robert Pattinson, the very end of that, you see him riding a motorcycle through the Glasgow Cathedral. And I think they shot some scenes in The Batman in Glasgow Cathedral as well. Amazing historic site. And Robert Wishart is buried right there in that, uh, in that uh, church. Robert Wishart, the Bishop of Glasgow, as well as James Stewart, plotted early on to foment revolt, proving immensely successful in this, as both men were closely linked with the most famous rebel of the period, William Wallace. It was Wallace's murder of the Sheriff of Lanark that signaled a wider uprising. Yet these lords were not idle themselves, raising the banner of revolt in the southwest. So that murder of the Sheriff of Lanark that they refer to is the scene you see toward the beginning of the movie Braveheart where they attack. In Braveheart, they show that the Sheriff of Lanark slits the throat of William Wallace's wife. There's no evidence that that happened, uh, but he did kill that sheriff. Also involved in this theater was the young Earl of Carrick, Robert Bruce. Bruce, unlike his staunchly pro-English father, threw his lot in with his own folk. However, this proved less a fire and more a whiff of smoke. The English under Robert Clifford and Henry Percy forcing their surrender at Irvine. A more successful campaign was waged in the Northeast under Andrew Murray. Murray would jointly command the Scots at Stirling Bridge and had already bloodied himself at Dunbar, where he had been taken and imprisoned in Chester Castle. Murray, though, had somehow escaped back north. Murray's Scots were initially beaten back when... So, by the way, if you're wondering, this right here is Loch Ness, which is why you have Inverness. Inver um, is actually a, a word that you'll hear. It's typically associated with a town or a location that's right at the end of one of these lakes. So, in this case, it's, it's Ness. And I think it has to do with either where the lake flows out of or flows into. I can't remember which is which. But uh, Loch Ness right there um, con contains more water 
than all of the lakes in England and Wales put together. And it's only like a mile and a half wide, and maybe, I don't know, 20 miles long, something like that. But it's almost 800 feet deep at its deepest point. Uh, so that's what gave rise to the ideas of Loch Ness Monster because it was so deep and people couldn't see the bottom, things like that. Really beautiful place to visit, though. They tried to take Castle Urquhart. However, following this setback, he enjoyed a series of successes as the campaigning season progressed into the summer. While Murray had been conquering in the north, to the south a comparative nobody raises his head, at least according to the Scottish source Forden. There is little doubt William Wallace was a remarkable man, having either an aptitude for or experience of warfare, leading small bands of men as an outlaw before his meteoric rise in 1297. The action at Lanark in May of 1297 marked Wallace's first major act on the national stage. Blind Henry's account of the day had Wallace murder the sheriff of Lanark and kill his men in revenge for the death of Marion Braidfoot, William's wife or lover. However, the Scala Chronicler states that the fighting began at a court presided over by Hesselrig. Wallace and his men slew the English and fired some houses. So I wanted to take a second and talk about this whole story of William Wallace's wife being killed and him murdering the guy responsible for revenge because they just alluded to it there. And the, the conventional wisdom by modern historians is that she is a medieval invention, that she really didn't even exist and that whole story was just kind of added to the legend of William Wallace later. Uh, but if she did indeed exist. This is the traditional story that we're told about it. It says it was at this time that, um, so this is after Wallace uh, came to the Clyde Forest after ambushing the English at Loudon Hill in July 1296. He took refuge near Lanark to rest his men. It's at this time he may have met Marion Braidfute for the first time. She was 18 years old, the daughter of the Laird of Lamington, which is kind of like a, a low-level kind of landowner. Uh, she is described by Blind Harry as, uh, quote, she suffered all and bore herself right lowly, so amiable she was, so benign and wise, courteous and sweet, full of noblesse, as of well-ordered speech. Wallace fell in love with Marion, but according to some sources, he had decided it would not be wise to marry till Scotland had been freed from the English. She informed Wallace that the sheriff, whom Blind Harry described as cruel, outrageous, and spiteful in his actions, had put to death her brother, who had come along with Marion to stay in his father's townhouse in Lanark. From that time forward, whenever Wallace was in town, he would secretly visit with her. Marion would encourage him and help him to get into her house through a back entrance in an alley behind the house. The sheriff, Hesselrig, had made plans for Marion to be wed to his son. This made their affair a very difficult one. Soon after, William and Marion promised to each other that as soon as he had freed his country, he would return to him and uh, return and claim her as his wife. Um, that they did not, in fact, get. Some people say they did get married, and he bore. Uh, she bore him a daughter, Elizabeth. Uh, during all of this, Sir Hugh Braidfute of Lamington died, leaving his daughter Marion, the surviving heiress of Lamington. And it said uh, that at some point, then supposedly. Uh, he is responsible for killing her in her own house. So we really just, there's no way to know for sure if it happened, but that's the story that Braveheart went with, uh, kind of a fictionalized version of that, a condensed version of it, uh, to kind of give William his reason for rising up and fighting against the English. Following Lanark, Wallace joined forces with William, the Lord of Douglas, and raided Scone. This at the urging of Robert Wishart, Though they reoccupied the place, the garrison commander William de Ormsby evaded their wrath. Around this time, the aforementioned negotiated submission in the southwest was taking place. However, unlike these noble men, Wallace refused to submit and regrouped in Selkirk Forest. So that's where you see, um, the, and again, we, we criticize Braveheart a lot for the, some of the stuff that they portray wrongly but even if they necessarily don't get it exactly right they're getting ideas correct and in this case you've got the no the the, the high-ranking nobles who have a lot of land and have a lot to gain or a lot to lose based on what happens 
submitting to the English king while Wallace is like, nope, gonna go fight him. In August, Wallace's force headed north of the Forth, fighting the English through Perthshire and Fife, their target being the castle of Dundee. By this point, Wallace and Murray were in contact and well aware that an English force was marching north to crush them. The English response to these risings was muddled. Though Clifford and Percy had marched north, they had My focused ancestors. on the supposed greater threat of James, Bruce, and Wishart. So you remember yesterday I mentioned the Scottish marcher lords and that the, the Percy family were one of the most powerful families in northern England who had a lot of responsibility for this. And Hotspur Percy, the one the football team is named after, but also who leads a rebellion against, I think, Henry IV, um, is a descendant of this Henry Percy. And the Clifford family, uh, who is the family I'm most closely related to in northern England, I'm descended from one of Robert Clifford's descendants, um, is uh, they're going to be seated at Skipton Castle outside of York. While Murray and Wallace had made steady gains elsewhere, Hugh de Cressingham was clearly not impressed, and in July had raised a sizable force of 300 cavalry and 10,000 infantry at Roxburgh. However, Percy and Clifford insisted on their way back south that all was well after the capitulation at Irvine. It was decided that no further action would take place until the Earl of Surrey himself arrived. Surrey, though, was hardly an inspiring presence. Already reluctant and old, he had even encouraged King Edward's attempt at replacing him, though his choice, Brian Fitzalan, pleaded poverty, claiming he was unable to oblige on account of the smaller salary he would receive. <laughs> I'm going to need more money if you're going to give me the job. So if I'm Edward at this point, I'm probably thinking, all right, you know what? I'm just going to have to march north and do this myself. Surrey was thus stuck with the task of dealing with the Scottish menace. King Edward himself was firmly fixed on his war with France and had set sail for Flanders on the August 22nd. So he's occupied. Meanwhile, Hugh de Cressingham awaited Surrey's arrival at Roxburgh. John de Warren arrived in the English capital of Berwick on the 28th of July, before riding to take command of Cressingham's army and heading north. Surrey's army made slow progress, perhaps reflecting their commander's attitude towards the enterprise, not arriving at Stirling until the second week of September. By the 10th of September, the pieces had been set. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we're dealing with here, right? Um, you've got the Scots formed into Shiltrons, which is their pretty common formation. The, these squares with pikes, um, 100 men wide and six men deep. Uh, De Moray and William Wallace are going to be in command. You're going to have the Earl of Surrey and Cressingham with the vanguard, which is the out front part of the force. Uh, only 4,500 infantry, but better equipped, better uh armored i'm sure and then 200 knights who are super well equipped and armored uh, but then you've also got another 1800 infantry 800 longbowmen which are going to be deadly on a battlefield especially against lightly or unarmored opponents the key point of convergence for both sides was the imposing and strategically vital castle of sterling Stirling overshadowed both the town itself and the narrow wooden bridge that spanned the fourth. And the Scots do such an amazing job with where they build their castles, right? Stirling Castle and Edinburgh Castle are both on these just juggernaut of a like kind of a outcropping of rock that just dwarfs the surrounding landscape and just looks down on everything. And when you look at these castles, they are just really imposing. In fact, I want to show you a picture uh, of Stirling Castle so you know what I'm talking about. There you go. That's what you're looking at. And Edinburgh Castle is very similar to that. It's way up there. And, and so, I mean, it's, it's an imposing place. But this battle is not really going to be about the castle at all. It's going to be about the fact that there just aren't a lot of bridges to cross the river. And that is where, once again, it all comes down to knowing your terrain, knowing your enemy's weakness, evening the odds. And that's what Wallace and Murray are going to do here. 
The geography of the area effectively cut the realm in two, this location proving the key to a landward invasion of the north. Yep, you had Stirling to cross bridge there. back then was a narrow crossing that could barely accommodate a horse and cart, meaning Surrey's men could only cross two abreast. The bridge itself connected to a causeway that led towards the Scottish position. In addition to the perilous prospect of crossing the bridge itself, Surrey's men would be hemmed into a meander of the fourth while deploying, which leaves us to wonder why he ordered the march across the bridge in the first place. Surrey halted in Stirling and surveyed the situation from his perch on the battlements, while James Stuart and the Earl of Lennox made their unsuccessful attempt to negotiate another Scottish climb down. Having ordered- and you see that portrayed in Braveheart, right? The attempt to negotiate rather than it coming to, f to actual fighting. With his men to ready for the morning crossing, Sari retired for the evening, only to rise late the next morning and find his army already crossing without his order. Hey, morons, get back. The vanguard was ordered back, only to be halted a second time when news reached Surrey that Stuart and Lennox had ridden back into camp. Back. So, here's the question. If you're Surrey, what do you do? Do you try and get some men across, risking the possibility that they get ambushed by the Scottish force, cut off and destroyed, but also getting the possibility that you get kind of a, a bridgehead, so to speak. You get across. Now you're not bottlenecked in that spot. What do you do? Perhaps with news of a Scottish submission. These lords bore no good news, and thus Surrey made a final attempt at peace by famously sending two Dominican friars to the Scots commanders on the Abbey Craig. Walter of Gisborough records the immortal response from Wallace himself. We are not here to make peace, but to do battle to defend ourselves and liberate our kingdom. Let them come on, and we shall prove this in their very beards. They may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. And no, they weren't wearing kilts. Kilts were not a Scottish thing yet at that point. Despite these defiant words, both Surrey and Cressingham would be forgiven in doubting the ability of the Scots to match them with arms. To be fair to Surrey, he had personally witnessed the shambolic performance of Scottish arms at Dunbar, so must have assumed this force, under the less noble Wallace and Murray, would be easy pickings. Richard Lundy, a Scottish knight advising in the English camp, urged Surrey to allow him to ford the fourth further upstream, to outflank the enemy and allow a safe crossing. Good idea. Hugh de Cressingham disapproved of such an action, and this is the problem. You underestimate your enemy at your peril. And when you get cocky, when you get overconfident, that's when you lose. With an eye on the continuing expense of the campaign, having already sent men home at Stirling, the treasurer criticizing the waste of the king's money on vain maneuvers. So what does that tell you about the mindset of a guy like Surrey? The king's money matters more to him than the lives of his soldiers. Because rather than do the smart thing and do a flanking maneuver that's going to give you a better chance to lose fewer men to win the battle, you're more concerned about the financial aspect of it. Unfortunately for the Royal Army, Surrey heeded Cressingham and finally ordered the crossing of the bridge. To his credit, Cressingham was no armchair general, leading around a third of the English army across, some 2,000 men and around 100 cavalry. Surveying events on the Abbey Craig, Murray and Wallace concluded their best chance of victory was to allow the vanguard to cross and attack at the point where they were most vulnerable. The Scots numbering around 6,000 spears, with a small complement of 400 longbowmen, were massed around half a mile away. Advancing onto Cressingham's vanguard in tightly packed shiltrons, the Scots may have given the English food for thought as they ominously veered into view at a steady, deliberate pace. Wall so you let them cross, but they don't have all of them across. So now you can take on a small part of the force. Uh, they're limited in their front, which helps you even the numbers. And now you try and destroy what you can and try to cause a panic and just a mess on that bridge. Wallace and Murray riding at the forefront, their ranks solid and disciplined, their pace increasing to charging speed. 
And why do you allow him to get across here rather than just try to stack him up at the bridge? I don't know exactly what the mindset was, but part of me thinks maybe at least part of it is the 800 archers, the, the longbowmen that the English have. If you draw part of the English force further away and their archers are back here, maybe you're out of range or at least you're in a place where they can't try and take a chance of hitting you. Uh, rather than if you're bottling them up at the bridge, maybe the archers come into play. The battle rapidly devolved into a slaughter. The stationary English horse, useless, along with their packed archers, mingled with the infantry. So they did have archers The Scots across. enjoyed local superiority in numbers and bloodily scythed their way through the panicking English. Soon the exit to the rammed bridge was cut off, forcing many English to attempt swimming the Forth to safety. Around 300 Welshmen managed to reach safety, though the constable of Stirling Castle, as well as much of his men, were slain. For the Scots, the greatest prize of the day came in the form of rotund and despised Hugh de Cressingham, who was unhorsed and cut down while his men fell about him. One Yorkshire knight, however, Marmaduke de Thweng, quickly realized the day was lost and led the English heavy horse towards a breakout of the envelopment. Their charge proved effective in smashing through to the bridge, but his daring escape was also the last serious resistance in the English mass. In an irony, since Cressingham had taxed and sold Scott's property to help finance his royal master's war with France, the treasurer's corpse was itself laid, pieces of his skin distributed as a prize among the victors. Hardcore, Yet Cressingham man. was not the only major casualty of the day, with Wallace's own co-commander, Andrew Murray, suffering a mortal wound, eventually dying around early November. So, I mean, that goes to show you that these guys fought, right? These weren't generals in the back sending their men into the fight. They were alongside their men fighting with them. Yes, they were better armored, better weaponed. They had horses. They had distinct advantages on the battlefield. Uh, but they were certainly vulnerable. The destruction of his vanguard dispirited both Surrey and the larger unengaged portion of his army. With no stomach for the fight, the Earl broke the bridge on his side of the Forth and rode hard for the relative safety of Berwick, leaving his lumbering army to tail him while dogged by attacks from the newly reconverted Earl of Lennox and James Stuart. Stirling Castle itself was not provisioned for a sustained siege and soon crowned the Scottish victory, Wallace capturing it. By November of 1297, Andrew Murray's death effectively made William Wallace the uncontested leader of Scotland. Wallace, as the surviving commander, also emerged as the legend of the period, though his newly minted reputation and position would soon be challenged by Edward Longshanks himself. If you so yeah, so Wallace is going to be the guardian of Scotland. The problem, of course, is that Scotland is not united. And this is the problem Robert the Bruce is going to face. And until you can unite your own country, you're never going to be able to stand against a more powerful country like England. And Wallace is going to end up being betrayed by some of his own. So we'll continue that story tomorrow. Let me know your thoughts. Use the comment section below. And we'll be back soon with the next episode. Thanks for watching.